Hi, right, welcome to Point of Power. My name's Matt. Um, I'm on Facebook now, which is great. Uh, so go check it out. There'll be some uh, announcements and new videos, a bit of chatting, this and the other. The other thing I want to um, talk about just briefly before we get into this topic is uh, scooternations.com forum. Um, there's a lot of nice guys on there. I found myself in a scooter situation. It's not usually the thing I do, but it's, uh, to be quite honest, quite fun. It's quite cool working with small engines. Um, but them guys are very friendly, very helpful. Uh, they get back to you really quickly. So go check it out, scooternations.com. Uh, cool little forum. Anyway, why I even brought that up is because there's a few guys on the forum who said, Oh, Matt, could you show us a bit of your uh, case matching? Um, people who don't know what case matching is, um, and cylinder flowing and case flowing. It's basically uh, a modification that you do to your two-stroke engine and usually for four-stroke engines you do the head um, and eventually I'll get around to that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the basics just a basic idea of what I do, uh, why we do it, stuff like that. Um, so so on, what is out. case matching and why do we do it? This is a case of a two-stroke engine chopped in two <laughs> That will become apparent by April. Um, but basically I can use this and as a Basically what we do is, this has come from the factory and with mass manufacturing things aren't always perfect. Um, they have to pump out a lot of these per day, for example. And they are inspected uh, quite briefly and they're not ideal. And it's cool actually, it's a good thing that that happens in mass production because then if they were like Ferrari and got it perfect every time then we'd all have nothing to do. Um, and I'd probably take up knitting. <laughs> so, why do we do... We'll start off with um, case flowing to start off with. Case flowing isn't an incredible modification. You are not going to flow your cases and all of a sudden you're doing an extra 10 mile an hour or something crazy like that or another 12 horsepower. Case flowing is more its more of a fickle thing to be quite honest. Um, engines get by fine without it, we're just optimising, we're just increasing its efficiency more than anything. Um, and basically what we're doing is we're removing all the, the junk and crap that was left over after the manufacturing process because it was quick. So what I'll do is I'll show you what this looks like uh, close up and then we'll go through what we do. So, we're at the bench and this is the transmission side of a Piaggio Hyper 2 engine. Um, these are fitted to a lot of uh, modern day mopeds nowadays, Gileras, um, most Piaggio zips, that kind of thing, derbies, etc. So basically inside here lives the crankshaft. We've still got the main bearings in this, so we'll have to pop them out and the oil seal on the back side. And then you have the opening for the cylinder, we have the studs, one snapped off. Fantastic. And then we have the water pump housing. As you can see, this is not very healthy. So this is off a Derby GP150. Um, this hasn't, I've done nothing to this to be quite honest, I've just literally taken it apart. So I thought this would be a good example of exactly where to start off. Now, inside you have all these channels. Um, here, this has been line bored out for the cylinder to fit on. I've got the cylinder somewhere. So your cylinder doesn't slide on because that's bent. Your cylinder slides on like so. Not very well. You get the idea. Um, so air is now top heavy. Air comes in this direction. Uh, we have a reed valve here which stops air passing the other way. We'll go through that in a two stroke video. Basically, air comes into this channel, crankshaft is in the way, and then the pumping action of the piston it then flows down this channel down the transfer ports into the cylinder. Basically, bypassing the piston. They call them transfer ports, but I was told as a young lad they were called bypass ports, but let's not be fickle. What we do have is the surface texture is a cast uh, a sand casted surface texture 
there's nothing really wrong with that. Um, but what we can do is we have some sharp edges and a few bits that could be smoothed out. To be quite honest, this isn't the worst one I've ever seen. That's actually quite a nice even edge. Some of them are terrible. Um, all chewed up and all the rest of it because someone's basically rushed the job or whatever or it was a bad casting and they could only spend so long on it. Um, so to floor this case what we need to do is we basically just need to increase or actually no, not increase we need to reduce the uh, I've forgotten what I'm saying. So basically to do a case flowing we're trying to reduce the amount of dead stops, walls um, anything impeding the flow of the air. It's more for high RPM applications. Um, at low speed, the air just swirls in here and then waits for the piston to shift down, transfers around it, la da 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 da. In high speed applications, it's what we have this little shelf here for. I don't know if you can see that very well. There, there's this shelf here. So basically, air comes in at low speed, hangs around in the crankshaft, the piston descends, increasing the pressure, and it goes around the transfer pots, which is this way and this way. At high speed application, at high RPM applications, I shouldn't have said that. At high RPM, the flow doesn't have time to hang around, wait for the piston to send, because the piston's in a hurry. So the air comes in and flows straight up these transfer pots and just straight across. Now that's where um, case flowing comes into its own, because basically this isn't an ideal. Um, profile. This isn't an ideal shape to allow that to happen. So basically what we're going to do is going to, and first I'm going to mark out areas of um, the general lumps that need to be modified to increase high RPM flow. If you are running a standard crank and a standard cylinder the really, leave it alone, there really isn't any need um, to do this, if you are upgrading to a 70cc, um, or you might even not be using a 50, you might have um, a 110 or a 125 or something like that. The same works with um, 350s, like XTs, stuff like that. Um, this can, you know, this can be used to that vein as well. So, first we're going to do is pop this bearing out, get the oil seal out, and I'll be back with you. I was going to pop this seal out and do this bearing off camera, but that isn't the whole point of doing the video. So basically I've got a flatted screwdriver. I'm just basically hitting the bottom. That C shape we talked about, that piece of steel. And bang! Oil seal's out. As you can see, that oil seal is damaged. Bim. I do have a bearing press, which a lot of people have the form do now. Um, but I'll show you the, the the quicker method, the quick and easy method that anyone can do. Right, like I said, there's many ways you can get bearings out. You can heat them out, you can press them out. One of my favourites is got a socket, sits on the inner race, place a hammer in the socket, get another hammer, make sure you're covering your eyes with something, your hand or something, and give it a good whack. Bang, there you go, as soon as you hear it, as soon as you hear the tone change, you're through. And just like that, sock it to one side, our oh, bearings out. Feels a bit crunchy that, goes in the bin. So inside, um, we have our bearing seat, so don't ever mark this end or there, this area here. Also got a bit of shite in there, that's not good. Uh, and as you can see with these you have an oil passage, this isn't the same of all two stroke engines, but you have an oil passage. Um, it's actually an oil and air passage, but anyway, any residual oil that sits in the transfer window here can basically dribble back down when the engine cuts out and sit with the bearing. So, now we've got the oil seal out and the bearing out. We can start cleaning this up. Nothing fantastic, because like I said, this is just an example. Uh, clean this up and I'll mark out and show you where and why we take out certain bits to help the air flow through the engine, or through the crankcase. Right, so we'll clean this bad boy out. 
Got some of these kitchen wipes. That just gets the, the general crap off. Now normally I'd have sandblasted this, I'd have and I find modelling clay, I would have covered the inside bearing surface, anything that I don't want blasting. Um, these main surfaces um, I actually take down to a smooth surface, so it's not really that much of a problem if they get blasted. Um, you can use silicon sealant, that's quite good. Um, anything basically that when you do sandblasting, it's kind of like rubbery. I use modelling clay, blue tack, anything like that. Um, anything that's rubbery will just bounce straight off. Uh, while the rest of it will clean it all up. So I usually sandblast the entire thing, get it all nice and clean because you've got to handle it as well. But that, I'll do for that, there's a, bit of, there's a few bits of stubborn crap on there. This is nearly empty. It's a bit of uh, brake and clutch cleaner. And uh, oh, that does it, look at that. That really takes all the oil and grime off. Solvents make your life a million, million times easier. If you haven't, if you're starting to do stuff like this, and you're going to start doing this on a regular basis, get yourself some um, brake and clutch cleaner. I don't have a preference to any particular brand. Really, even the cheap stuff um, from your local car, car suppliers or Alphas or any place like that usually does the trick. Um, as you can see, that's lovely and clean. Um, leave it to dry, I've got to go and have a cuppa, and uh, when I'm back we'll crack on. Right, <coughs> excuse me. So, where do we cut and where don't we cut? Well, to show you, and there's no bearing inside it, and weirdly enough, that's the wrong size crank. Well, forget that. As an example, if we get something round, it pretty much fits in there. This is where the throw of the crankshaft lives. Um, if I turn it, you can see what I want you to take note of is this ledge. What we'll do is I'll zoom you in a bit so you can see. Do I get the orientation of the camera right? You can see this ledge here. Now, do we need to take out this ledge? Not really. The main throw of the crankshaft sits directly behind it. So air being drawn in hits the throw of the crankshaft. This really isn't our main concern. However, you can, and I'll use a marker to make it obvious, you can round off that edge if you feel like it. Just a bit. So you mark out, get yourself a permanent marker, uh, one better than this. This is just a watermarker marker just to show you. So basically we'll round off the edge ever so slightly, there is no real reason. Sometimes, if I move it to a better location, sometimes here, where they've line board this, and this, this section is line board so the cases are matched together, um, there can be a lip. Now you want to get rid of that. This is quite smooth, that's quite a nice transition, but we'll get rid of that lip. Um, our main concern is this shoulder this nice big shoulder and if I turn it that way you can see that shoulder it's quite a pronounced shoulder that at high speed there flows in and it crashes into there when it crashes into here, into there the air ramps up and then you get a, a vacuum point a void there you start getting eddies and drags and that actually slows down the amount of fuel and air mixture that is transferred above the piston, um, which isn't good. Another area is this sharp edge here. You can take that down a bit. Now there are two areas that are to be taken into consideration when you're doing this. These are the two studs. The two studs go in here and they're threaded down to about here about 15mm, 10mm inside the casing. If you start hogging this off, and this is what a lot of people do and I see them do it, you actually breach 
the thread. Now, unless you're using some kind of gas gasket sealant, these aren't airtight threads. Um, so if you have breached, you are going to have an air leakage, and it's going to leak straight up and out somewhere, probably where the nut is on the end. Um, so we want to kind of not stay away from these areas, but be quite aware of that. The other thing I did as well on the Scooter Nation forum when I did another one of these um, nearly well a year ago now. Um, this section here is extremely thin, so you don't really want to touch this in any way, shape, or form. We're talking two mil, two and a half mil. I actually drilled through a broken ca a broken casing, and it was actually a transmission casing like this. I drilled through there and actually measured the depth, the thickness of the aluminium there, and it actually comes out. It actually comes out. If I can, if I can show you, it actually comes out to that bit there, and that is seriously thin. It's one of the thinnest part of the castings. So if you start hogging out material here just after the reed, you're going to get seriously thin. Chance of it breaking through are small, but you don't want to really risk that. And you're probably more chance of actually risking it, uh, risking it going through by you actually grinding. Um, so let's crack on. So what do we want to do? One of the first things we want to do is we'll concentrate on this shelf. So what would be nice is to smooth off a round section there. But you've got to remember this is a three-dimensional shape. So we need to smooth off this entire corner and then come to there. This feels like a triangle, it's three-sided. So we want to round this off and you can kind of blend it in to there. Basically what we're after is taking off oops. Is taking off the point. We want to take off this point if I'm Bring you in again. We want to take off this point, not this entire shoulder, because like I say, you'll go through to the bolt. A lot of people like to use that plasticine liquid metal malarkey. I don't like the idea of that. If it's not adhered properly, or if you put it into like a V-shaped hole or anything like that, it could break off, it'll jump around here, it'll go to the top of your piston and then your engine's added. The next place we want to kind of treat is here. What I do is I literally draw a line of interest and then just band that out. So I want to try and smooth that off so it's a, more of a nice smooth transition. This is too much of a perfect circle, this is too much of a sharp edge. This isn't for high floor, this is just because we're in here so we might as well tidy what there is. As the air circulates around, you've got a spinning crankshaft. Um, air will buff it against here, again causing turbulence, which is not what we want. Going to the uh, oops, going to the transfer channel, as you can actually see on this casting, this is bare casting, this is bare casting, and they've actually ground that out, that's actually a different colour. You can see a lot better on actually on the camera than you can with my eyes, and there's a bit there on the inside. So basically what I want to do is kind of make this a smooth transition, that's too much of a sharp edge, that goes straight and then down. So I want to blend that in. Never intrude into the bearing surface, just don't do it. It's as simple as that, it's just a rule. This bearing surface, just don't touch this in any way. Um, once, and the best thing to do this is to do it in stages. It's so like I say, you attack the basics, like what we've just marked out, and then you start seeing what else there is to have a go at, which just looks like excessive metal, there's no reason for it to be there. There's a ledge on the inside here, you can see that's actually got a burr on it, you can see where it's there, there's a burr. We can take that out, we can actually smooth off that entire edge completely. Um, when we get down to it we can, blur, we can blend this, that's quite a sharp edge there, we can blend this into this and incorporate the whole thing. So basically what we want is a nice smooth transition uh, into there. So, as soon as you've marked out, I know I haven't really marked it out, we'll say around there, this isn't a brilliant pen, there we go, a bit of pressure, around there, and on the inside here, like so. This edge we want to have a look at, but we'll have a look at when we... The other thing is as well is, um, 
if you have no idea where you're going, get your cylinder, and I don't have the right one, but get your cylinder, put it on, and see where things are. There are the main cylinder. Get that There's these main cylinder in prongs to give the cylinder its its desired stroke and length. If these back into the cylinder, so if you have one of these ledges that we've been marking out and it's pressed against the back of one of these, then there's no point taking that out because air isn't going to get between there, well it is a tiny amount, but the, fl the main flow of air isn't going to get between there and there, so don't bother taking that out because there's no need. Otherwise you have to start taking this out, which is not what you want to be doing. Now we've roughly planned out our course of action, uh, this main edge, this transfer lip and this knife edge. Um, what tools do we use? Well, I was asked, well I wasn't asked, there was a, a question on the forum on schoolnations.com um, and someone had seen a machine mark Dremel kind of tool, a rotary tool, and asked, "Is will this work? Well, yes it will. Um, I have a Dremel 3000. This was £45 from Argos, I believe. I used to have a Kawasaki one that was very good. I used to have one before that off a market stall that was 30 quid, and it was terrible. It was absolutely horrible. Um, the 3000, the 4000 is a lot better, and I will be getting one of them. Uh, but the 3000 was cheap. I never used them before. I wanted to see what the crack was about all this Dremel arc. Um, and then I was asked, what do you use? Well, with my Dremel, I've got this Dremel kit, the 100 accessories. And in the kit you get sanding drums, like so, carbide ones, la da 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 And then you get other stones, like that. And then you get these sanding drums. And you get them in two sizes. I'll just get them out so you can see. We have a small one and a big one. Now, stones. These cases are aluminium. Um, and they will stick like monkey shit to them. The aluminium likes to um, melt, pretty much. And it likes to gum up and stick to things. You'll find the same thing if you use a file, a draft file, or a bastard file, or something like that. It likes to flake off, and the flakes are quite... Um, the swath is quite sticky. It likes to cling. These sanding drums, and this is an absolute knackered one, and I don't I have to go to B&Q tomorrow and get some more. But these sanding drums are probably your best friend. Um, this is a 60 grit one, and as you can see it's absolutely pulverised. If you go out and buy a Machine Mart or a B&Q Special or God knows, a Tesco's one, um, that's fine. You know, you have to get what you have to get. You have to get what's available to you, both in price and location. Um, what I do recommend is that you get the Dremel sanding drums. Regardless of what your rotary tool is, get the Dremel sanding drums. They are a lot better than the other ones that I've ever bought. Um, these are brilliant. You also get the smaller ones. That's also another knackered one. Um, and in the next video, when I start actually uh, grinding on this case, um, you'll see me. You'll see me in action. So, unfortunately, we can't go any further right now. Um, that's for the next video. But uh, thanks for watching, and uh, join me for the next video in a bit.